just hold it down. You're good. So, All right, go back. Yeah. Excellent. All right, thank you, and thank you for those who come today in um, in the building, and also to those online. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know me and Rob already through various things, but um, I'm Zoe Wormald, I'm a senior engineer with TFL, and Rob? I'm Rob Powell, I'm a project engineer for DLR. And so today um, we've, I think almost it's like the honour of coming <laughs> here, I think, to, to sort of representing really um, TFL track design department in presenting this. and. Um, I'm sort of keen that you know, this is something that's been a, a, a story in its making really in the, over the last 10 years um, and uh, so realistically what we're, we're trying to do today is just give you a brief understanding of the concept of it and, um, and how it's developed over that time. So hopefully, have I lost it? There? Okay, there we go. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to talk about um, briefly what is LU56 because after the B. So I'll talk about it quite a lot. So rather than get through to the middle of the presentation and not know what it is, we'll just give a very brief understanding of what it is, um, why we needed it on London Underground in particular. Um, and then Rob's going to talk about some of the development timeline, um, the switch geometry itself, and developing the design and that testing and approvals. And then I'll come back to me and I'll talk about its use across um, London Underground to date, uh, the next steps and a little bit about um, the contributors. And again, we've got in the in the sort of the room today, we've got quite a lot of people from track design and project engineering, people who've been installing it using um, the, the sort of the geometries themselves in different jobs. So it's good that they're here today. Okay, so what is um, LU656B? So in terms of the sort of the basic premise of it, um, it's a, a flat bottom geometry that mimics that of the ball head um, straight plane um, sort of footprint. So if we needed something that essentially would fit in to those locations where we were using um, ball head um, sort of turnouts. Um, and that would need to replicate that sort of um, footprint and space. <clears throat> so in terms of why we needed it, um, obviously due to the age of the, um, the network, we have an awful lot of bullhead rail on the system. Um, and over time, slowly but surely, it's not gonna happen overnight, we're trying to reduce the amount of bullhead rail that we're using. Um, and so we've had sort of programs in terms of, as well as the sort of the major renewals, we've also had a sort of a set of um, works in terms of flat bottom renewals, et cetera, in terms of changing, um, just re-railing in flat bottom. So we've had that sort of aspect as well. Um, we've obviously, in terms of asset condition, all head roads generally within areas where we, we do, being older track, have got poor asset condition and we're in a position of needing to actually undertake renewals. And under those circumstances, whether it was being within depots and sidings with sort of very complex, compact layouts, or whether it was within the PNC, within deep tube, we needed um, something that would, would fit that the existing footprints. So I'll go on to talk a little bit and give some examples of those. And in particular, we were aware at the time um, that we were gonna need to be supporting um, so both sort of introductions of new rolling stock and also um, the sort of signaling systems of the different upgrade programs that were coming both for S-Stock and also for the sort of PPE line upgrade. So we had both of those projects sort of in the mind's eye that we would sort of be undertaking a lot of renewals, um, in particular around depots um, and sidings and again in terms of looking to try and increase speeds and gen times um, for, for the trains. And like was just at the bottom there, in terms of VMAX, so Bullhead um, does give us some restrictions in terms of the speeds that we can achieve using it. And again, in terms of the new signaling systems and um, the new trains coming on, 
and the pressure from the business really to be increasing the trains per hour. And it was a requirement to actually see if we could get, get more speed out of the track. <clears throat> so as I say, in terms of bullhead rail, as much as sort of um, we we are sort of our, we have a renewables program and we're getting through in terms of replacing in flat bottom. There's an awful lot of bullhead rail that's still on the system. Um, so I've, I'm just going to example here in terms of the Piccadilly line in the deep tube. So um, in the in the tube section itself, we've still got 67% of the track is bullhead rail. Um, so you know this isn't something that we're suddenly going to disappear overnight. We're going to have the ball head there for a long time. Um, and so on the plane line, obviously, we can sort of, again, there are options in terms of just re-railing. Um, but where we have the interface with ball head P and C, um, the question is what we do at those points. Do we leave ball head islands? And in terms of, you know, there are things we can do with ball head P and C. We try to improve reliability in terms of the introduction of ball head cast crossings and things like that. But again, it's sort of having those particular islands still left in place that we're trying to avoid. And then also, I mean, it, we've got, I think, sorry, I'm trying to nick slides from other people, but about 1,800 point ends across the system. And 50% of those are in depots and sidings. And in reality, our depots and sidings, unless they're very new or have been upgraded recently, again are in bullhead um, ground. And uh, so we have the situation with the sort of the bullhead older track. Um, we're also getting bigger trains, um, greater frequency, sort of higher train speeds on the main, plus automatic train operation where we've got trains stopping. Um, and breaking at the same points across the network, and then sort of, sort of all of those things leading together, um, ending up in a situation where we've got sort of greater rail defects, rail breaks, PNC failure, and um, derailments, and a lot of that is linked around the bullhead track. So you can't see quite the detail in here, but again, in terms of bullhead. As much as sort of over time, we sort of managing to sort of reduce down the number of um, broken rails. The blue bar is the bullhead rails in terms of where we're actually um, getting uh, broken rails, and it's consistently the bullhead that's actually causing us problems and giving us the greatest number of rail breaks. So, in terms of again, if we're trying to move away from that, again. As well as the flat bottom rebailing, we can then link in also with um, the replacement of bullhead P and C. So again, whether or not you can link it directly to the fact that it's bullhead, or whether again it's just old sort of asset, life expired track within depots, you know, sort of we have a sort of inevitably have an awful lot of derailments, or we have had an awful lot of derailments within the depots. And the sort of the big culprits of those within Ryslip Depot and also Ealing Common. Um, and sort of it got to the point, especially around sort of 2018, where a number of derailments we were having was sort of getting to the point where the old commissioner at the time was sort of <laughs> being raised and the, the, uh, the high profile nature of that meant that something had to be done and we were under pressure to actually remove those sort of limit the risks of derailment and to sort of um, look to actually just get that out of the system. And so money was going to be made available for actually to do renewals um, at those depots. And the question is, what would we do? What what had, did we have the opportunity to do? <coughs> so back in 2014-15, um, um, we this is sort of Hammersmith Depot um, on the district line and oh, sorry Hammersmith and City line and um, you can see on the sort of left hand side of the picture the the, the straight mains um, and they're going into the platforms and then there's another um, sort of turn out that goes through to another platform platform three but you can see just how close 
the, the what was the depot and is now a sort of signal control siding is to that main line. And so at the time when we didn't have LUC 56B as an option, we had to basically replace all of the junction work coming off that in Bullhead um, and in terms of preparation for the, um, for the works to actually um, turn it into a signal control siding because it's part, it was one of the first areas or was the first area to, to be ATC signaled. Um, so they were originally installed as handwork points and then we did um, drilling such that it could be converted to six foot Sherlock's <coughs> afterwards. So again, at this point, we didn't have that alternative. You know, the space constraints within the depot just meant that we had no other option um, to, to line up with the existing shed roads. So again, we were forced down the bullhead route. And so another example within depots. So again, we've also got the situations where we've got P and C, which is going down onto the main, which had already been replaced in flat bottom. And then sort of so the picture at the top, um, this is the sort of the, the throat going into the West End Green <coughs> Common Depot. Um, and so essentially you had bullhead um, track and um, sort of butting on with sort of toe-to-toe -to -toe dimensions of around three meters. Um, so it would have just been at the IRJ that we would have had sort of junction fish plates, etc. So um, again, we didn't want to end up with a situation where we were replicating that again. So we've got <coughs> flat bottom on the map going out to the main. Can we actually get flat bottom going all the way through and get LU56 played a part in that? So I say it wasn't just a case of sort of those constrained areas like depots um, where we've got those sort of historic layouts that we had the problem. Um, so we knew as well that within the deep tube that we'd also have similar situation. So the example I've given here is in relation to Paddington 7 bs on the Blue line. And um, the designer for this, Nick Wood, was able to, to actually sort of skillfully squeeze um, sort of an NR56V uh, into the, to replace the existing head um, layout there. But it sort of came at a price, really. So you can see from the sort of um, the shaded diagram, the sort of the, the brownie area is the, the sort of cabin in terms of where the PNC is sitting. And then the purple legs are the sort of the single bore tunnels. Um, and by changing across from the bullhead to um, the flat bottom, he's actually had to sort of push the toe another sort of two and a half meters into the single bore, which sort of this time worked, you know, sort of clearances were tight. And you can see from the photo that sort of they've had to go down and actually sort of dig out around the tunnel ribs to actually sort of put a template in to see if they can actually get the um, this free hag uh, direct fits um, sort of to actually fit within the, within the area. So, you know, sort of, yes, it can be done, but it was at the expense of moving the toes. And obviously in terms of the sort of um, lines where we've already got um, automatic signaling, um, we've got sort of signaling systems in place that you know, we can't move the toes. The cost of moving the toes just becomes exorbitant such that, you know, if that toe position is fixed, we can't, we can't use that as a solution. So again, it was a case that we would have to um, find another way of, of managing that. Uh, so um, in terms of the speeds themselves, um, we sort of, within our um, design standards, um, we sort of have sort of lower um, sort of limiting sort of values for count efficiency and rate change of count efficiency between full head and flat bottom. Um, so I've just put, I mean, it's difficult to see any property presenters, so it's not too bad. Um, in terms of the sort of various um, levels that we can go to. Um, now, 
we've also made sort of a distinction between areas where we've got clearance issues as well as no clearance issues. So where we have where we're unrestricted by clearances, we've sort of got the ability to actually raise those limits on the flat bottom, um, sort of both in sort of standard speeds and also in the enhanced speeds. So again, when we've got um, automatic uh, train protection type railways or signaling systems. So even just sort of giving an example on the, the main, I've used one of our sort of speed sheets that we've used for um, sort of doing the speed reviews for the, for the, uh, for the sites. Um, just on a straight main, oh, I've lost the E. Um, in, terms of, in terms of when you compare, this is on just on a, a straight main, uh, sort of a five, sorry, a 500 meter radius curve um, on the basis that that would be the, the through route um, and zero cant, the difference between a sort of a ball head turnout with no infringements and a, and a flat bottom, we're talking about six and a half kilometers um, an hour in terms of the speed, which when we're being pressed by um, sort of the, the signaling designers to get every single kilometer an hour out of it, um, the, the systems actually makes quite a big difference for us. So it's just a case that, again, we were looking to, to sort of maximise the speeds that we could actually get within the railway. I'll hand over to Rob to have a quick run through our uh, timeline. Cheers, Harry. Right. As you can see on here, this is the development timeline from LU, for LU56. Um, looking at records, we think it's about 2014, don't we? Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. in there, the initial, initial concept and development started. Then later on, 2016-17, first type testing at Middlebridge Depot. Then I missed the depot for the first <laughs> test installation and the ACE safety case. Moving on to 2019-2020, we've got Ian Cobbin, um, East and West fans. And then we uh, achieved um, APR full approvals and then the approved project registered. 2001, again, another installation in Rice Depot. 2021 uh, to 22, we had a Unistar was then the um, point machine of choice. So yeah, we had to look at that and for South Harris sidings and coming up to now roughly is PLU where we plan to be in a North Fields Depot and Cot Fosters. Okay, but, um, going back to the development, when we first started looking at this, we really needed to know what the differences were between bullhead and flat bottom geometries. So we had our own uh, bullhead geometries in uh, London Underground and we had network rails um, flat bottom geometries. So we need to understand what the differences were. So flat bottom switches, they are curved geometry that tangents to the main line. So basically produce the switch radius, so it tangents to the main line in front of the toes. Uh, we have a plane radius from the toe to the 70 mil, I know the people on there can't see it, but if you go back, there's a 70 mil where the head where, no, the head where, the head width comes to 70 mil. And then they're generally longer in length than brill head. Um, and with the brill head geometry, that's what I call an intercept, intercepting geometry, where if you produce the switch curve forward, that intersects the main line. But at the origin, it's offset by a distance and for an A switch, I think it's about 52 mil. Um, yeah, and then, at the, where, where the plane radius would be, that was a straight from the, the toe to the 70 mil head width, and generally these are shorter. Uh, so we looked at these geometries, and to make a, a flat bottom fit into an A7, we would need to make a, a 1 in 6.2 with the turnout radius of 113 meters to make it fit in that footprint from toe to nose. So, and obviously you've got the, the issues at the back, where you're trying to tie in uh, 6.2 crossing, but it should have been a seven, uh, seven, a one in seven crossing. So that after we understood these, um, the geometries between the two, we sat down and came through with some sort of requirements we needed to do before we came to the design. So, you know, we needed to make the toe, uh, the turnouts curved, planed and chamfered, so we get rid of the straight planing. Um, we needed that lateral offset to fix this lead length so we could fit into the bullet um, footprints. The radius of the natural turnout, we wanted to make a 
complete radius from the, the nose to the switch toe. So we had one complete radius all the way through. All this geometry was then based on 1435 uh, mainline track gauge. Um, obviously, as Zoe said before, we wanted to fit toe to nose dimension to get as close as possible to the wheelhead geometries. And also the crossing details, we have minor changes uh, to NR56 equivalents just because of the, the, the turnout radius we predicted would be slightly different. So you might need to make some sort of changes to the, the noses with the blocks. So we, we crunched the numbers and then we came up with our first attempt at, well, after several trial attempts at the um, LU5687 vertical variety. As you can see, there's, we've improved the entry angle by about 0.6 of a degree. So we've shallowed that down. We got rid of the straight and uh, made that curve and also read a switch and turnout radius equal all the way through. And then we got a total no difference between the bullet A7 and the LU87, um, A7, LU56, A7 of about 13 years. So that was for, and as you can see before with the NR56 in blue, that's an A7 plotted there. And it's, a, it's about one point, yes, there, isn't it? Well, nearly two meters longer, 2.1 meters longer. So obviously you can see it can fit in that geometry. <coughs> After we fixed the calculations, um, we need to do, uh, fix the <laughs> we need to do, um, assure ourselves that we get the correct toe opening. Um, so as you can see, the, the picture at the top shows the, the sort of sketch of a switch. So we've got the toe opening is the little star in front of the toe, and the minimum flange right at the end of the head cut there should be 50 mil. To do this, we have to come, because we're only a little band of team uh, working on it with sort of limited budget. We came up with our own flexing cap, but the, the, the assumptions were based on work that Progress Route and Metronet did prior to this in about 2010, I think it was maybe, maybe a bit earlier. Uh, so that used a stiff mix matrix calculation, um, which we needed to, which used, which found displacements along the switch rail. So we assumed that the switch rail would be a fixed and cantilever beam with a point load in the y, y, y axis, so it's moving like this. Um, so we can uh, understand what the, um, the uh, flexing would be for it. Also, we need to actually uh, include friction factors so we can um, mimic sort of well maintained to poorly maintained track. This was done by um, uh, assuming sort of point loads in the, in the center of each bearer on the movable length. As you go along in the opposite direction to the switch, just to make uh, put that friction force on it. So if it's zero, it's frictionless. If it's 0.6, it's very poorly maintained track. Um, then we we use the point opening of point, uh, 105 millimeters because that's the minimum um, toe opening we use on the, on the uh, network. And also, as you can see from the calculations, um, this is the actual um, graph that we produced that the the toe opening is represented, the minimum toe opening is represented by the uh, red box. And as you can see, all four friction values in the different colours are outside that box. And we were getting between 58 and 64 mil toe opening at that location. So from that, we knew we theoretically we could get that toe opening. And then we went on to produce our 1 in 50 uh, uh, like heel Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Toe? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, then we produced our one in fifty design, um, so we could get this produced before we done the um, what's it called? Uh, testing uh, trial. Yeah. Yeah. First type testing. That was the one in the Lily depot. So at the time, we didn't know this was just going to be used for depots. So we did design our own stress transfer block, which was based on the. Um, <laughs> the NR56 variant, but we used three holes for that. And because um, we couldn't really use the NR56 version because of the difference in radii and offsets and where it was placed. <laughs> uh, the foot relief uh, we added on there because we've uh, historically got problems with AV and DV switches with the heel opening. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we, we put that in there as a precaution. Um, 
to the spacer blocks along the, know, between the stock and switch rail. So they, they were put in there to maintain gauge, but also they were specifically made because of the difference in offsets between the main line and the back of the switch rail, or stop, uh, sorry, between the stock and switch rail. We also incorporated uh, Swearhag um, monocultured slide plates um, with rollers. Well, sorry, I have not got that one, but we had monocultured slide plates and Swearhag integrated rollers along the, uh, I think the rollers were bearer one and bearer four, as I remember. And also we looked at using orange uh, stretcher bars with yellow brackets, but later we looked at also, and we trialed the deep green or the dark green stretcher bars, which are a bit more robust when we come to do the um, uh, the, the trial at the Libris Depot. Uh, you probably can't read this, but this is a comparison between uh, Bullhead, LU50, Bullhead in the blue, LU56 in green, AV modified in orange, and the white one at the end is the standard AV, REPW. These just show the differences uh, in, in componentry used throughout the switch. Uh, where the heel bars, uh, sorry, the stretcher bars go, the heel load, um, what um, flange way opening you get at the head cut. And as you can, if you can zoom in this, but we can't, uh, we, we try to use as much common componentry from the uh, network rail switches for our OE56 switch. So yeah, the only difference really were the stress transfer blocks and the um, spacer blocks. And everything else should be quite similar, apart from obviously the stretches. But uh, if you can read that, you can see that um, the AVM needed a snipe cut at the head cut to produce the 50 mil. And also the um, AV switch, the REPW version, on our on our records got 50 mil. So we could um, we're confident we could get our 60 our 63 mil. Then we come to the new bridge. Little bit depot trials where uh, we had a panel set up, uh, thanks to Howard and all the boys construction that, um, where we conducted a series of um, tests in the depot, five tests in all, to uh, make sure the product met the requirements of um, uh, the, the document that we were testing to. Uh, so there were five tests, two were used with bars, and three were powered. And from those tests, we found out that it satisfactorily met the product requirements, apart from the detection test where it failed. But uh, so we needed to write standard to S1195, uh, concession to the standard SS1195 for the detection, but it improved on AV and AV shallow depth, I believe, for the detection. Um, then we went on to looking at putting this in at, um, what was this one? Upminster. Upminster, thanks, sorry. We looked at putting <laughs> this in at Upminster, but before we could do that, we needed uh, vampire testing, because we haven't uh, gone through vampire testing with this product to see uh, the wheel rail interface, and what would happen there. And from that testing, uh, it was produced that it, there was, um, if there was poor geometry, and high friction, it was a high risk of derailment. So from that testing, we come up with a series of conditions or site specific conditions that we needed to impose for that installation. So we needed to change the depot maintenance regime to lubricate the rail and include the new half sets at uh, 1134. <coughs> uh, the stock fronts needed to be welded to guards against twist or alignment faults. So we didn't want the um, joint sticking or um, cross, cross level errors there. Um, the crossing a bus in the front needs to be replaced and the 20 metres to the approach needs to be put to class one tolerances uh, to make sure that we've got a smooth run into those points. We needed a full as built as it was constructed so we could check the alignment had been installed to class one tolerances and also that the points were hand lubed before um, installation or being brought into service. Then uh, I think I can't remember just before or um, after at the or before or during. But also it was discovered that if we change the um, planing of the toe from uh, of the angle, 65 to 70, then, then we, we could reduce the uh, wheel climb on the switch. So the, in late revisions of the drawing, we, we, we changed the um, planing to 75 mil. Uh, 70 mil 
and hopefully that improves the switch. And then we got uh, product approval, I'm um, sorry, the safety case was endorsed, and then we got product approvals in November 2020 for this switch, but uh, our restriction was it could only be used in depots and siding. Uh, later on in November 2001, uh, Unistar came on the scene for our switches. Um, so we needed to test that because the new toe opening would be 160 instead of um, uh, 105 that we were looking at. So we need to check that that switch was flexing correctly. But before we done that, there was a problem. Um, as you can see there, there's a toe extension. So the, the Unistar um, points equipment can fit onto there and throw the switch. But obviously, that wasn't taken account of back in 2014 because we were using shore locks or, or handwork points. And uh, as they tried to close the switch, it wouldn't close. So uh, we looked at it, obviously looked at it and said, okay, we need to extend the um, foot chamfer on the stock rail to make that switch closed. And that was uh, later done. And then we carried out our tests for the 160 toe opening. But due to fears that this might cause um, uh, deformation, plastic deformation, or induced fracture um, weakness into the switch. Uh, we measured the open, uh, the open toe, the open switch with a two meters straight edge, marked every 100 mil <coughs> along from the toe going back into the into the switch. And as you can see from this graph, the three at the bottom uh, for uh, zero toe opening, 110 and 130 um, toe opening, and they produce a, a smooth graph. As you can see, as we go to 160, a deformation starts to take place in that switch. So from there, we decided, or um, whoever decided, to keep uh, <laughs> it wasn't me, uh, to keep the uh, toe open into 130 millimeters. So we knew that it, it, the shape of the switch would be fine, but that if you wanted to go to 160, that the full um, um, finite element analysis and dynamic study need to be done in that switch for it to be open to that toe dimension. So, oh, sorry. Uh, that's, now, right. that's a quick brief development, so I will hand that down to Zoe. <laughs> so, yes, so um, we've, since then, I, I, I've added it up and um, we've now put in, I think it's about 40 LU 56B switches across our system already, which, uh, yeah, it's a bit surprising. <laughs> and we need to keep an eye on. Um, so, yeah, we, it goes to show just how much investment we, there's been in terms of actually um, doing sort of depots and siding renewals in preparation for a lot of the um, up and coming or sort of uh, rolling stock developments, etc. So I've actually got what I noticed when, once I was looking at these slides just before I came out that that one three four points is actually the Upminster one. It's come off my table, <laughs> but the rest the rest of them there. So say the first the first location that we looked to to actually install them in was uh, on the West Van the Vian Common Depot, and it is a classic example of where we really needed to put it in. Uh, this photo doesn't do it justice really, but um, essentially the the, the main um, spine going up the, around the outside of the site was was our 70 meter radius. So it, it was sort of a definite, we were never going to be fitting anything else in. So we, we've gone from the point of uh, Upminster with the sort of the, the straight main to be looking to try and put it in on the 70 meter curve. So we were, we've, we've really tested it. Um, and as you can see from the crossing angles as well, you know, this was an incredibly tight site. Um, NR56 was just never going to work. And it would have otherwise have ended up going back in bald head. So, um, but because of those radii, um, we worked with Darren Sharp at the time, um, who was at the uh, principal engineer for PNC. Um, and just looked at some of those sites. So we have made other tweaks in terms of actually putting in some gauge widening on those and additional neck planing. Um, so yeah, those were a bit of a special, uh, and again, we need to, to make sure that we've got those fully recorded. I would say that on the LU56, when we put them in, we actually do put a plate um, to actually say on the switches what they are. 
so that people people do know and uh, don't <coughs> make us, don't make some assumptions. So that it was a requirement of also <coughs> the uh, safety. But as you can see, on the, on the West End, very tight. Um, a classic example of where we really needed it. Um, and uh, from the photo earlier, again, where we were able to then join um, existing, um, the sort of where it's toe-to-toe, -to -toe, existing flat bottom onto new flat bottom. Uh, and then, again, it was a bit better, <laughs> the eastern end. So we obviously had success. Derailment stopped, so that was very popular. Um, and you'll see the condition, the condition of the truck for the maintainers significantly improved. So uh, after after that success, um, we got money to do the the east east van as well. So again, you I mean, you can see a huge number of points. Um, sort of again, not as tight. We would sort of we managed to get all the way up to eighty two meters meter radius there on the on the on the fan on that spine um but again where possible because there was a bit more room between um that throat and the sheds um we actually had the ability to to try and standardize the use of a lot more of the sort of the straight main one in seven consistent radio all the way through that have been put in at Artminster um and to sort of and minimize the number of variants that we were having. So yeah, it, it gave us a bit more of an option for that. And then in terms of um, sort of, we then moved on to Ricelip. And so for stages one and two that are currently being put in, um, again, we've sort of even more space, even more space available. And so you can see, we've literally just standardized the, the switches um, throughout. Uh, again, just some sort of limiting the number of spares that are required. Um, and again, just in terms of the geometries that we can achieve. Um, so that's been a uh, sort of good one. And then likewise, in terms of, as we say, moving towards South Harris Signings, which is the first of the Piccadilly line upgrade projects that we've done um, in Move, and as Rob said, in terms of moving towards the Unistar rather than generally the handwork points operated um, sort of switches that we'd had before. Again, it's virtually a greenfield site to be able to, to sort of space out the, the SNC and to get those sort of uh, straight mains. Some that we've got a few mainly with straight crossing lanes, but we've got a few with curved crossing lanes. So, so yeah, going forward. So as I said, we put 40 in. It's quite a surprising number. <laughs> um, obviously, as part of the sort of the product approvals and going from a trial site to being fully approved. We've gone back to the maintainers um, and the installers and talked to them about the installations and uh, and got thumbs up. But as I say, part of that obviously is given where we were coming from on a lot of the depot sites, that's not really possibly a big surprise. Um, but going forward, I think we're aware that we really need to, to go back and look at these sites in more detail and actually do proper sort of full um, review of the wear on the switches um, and sort of look to see if they're doing what we, we're expecting and if there's again any further modifications that we need to make so that's that is something that's on our radar um, and and then in terms of obviously making sure that our own records uh, are up to date in terms of where we've installed them so although we've got the plaques on site have you know Maximo currently doesn't record them as being LU56. So again, we want to make sure that we've got that on our system and that we're sort of being able to sort of pick up trends um, if there are reports coming back from faults or in for inspections and things like that. Um, obviously, going forward, PLU advances and. Uh, Again, an awful lot more. And I have to say that PLU was probably one of the big drivers, again, in terms of it actually happening. There's a significant number of roads going in, a lot of stabling required. 
And so a lot of what was driving um, LU56 was the promise of, that we would have it available for Cockcross, Woods and Northfields. So those designs are currently underway. Um, and again, I know that they're looking to try and utilize just again, fairly bog standard units as much as possible. Um, but again, we'll be going in with the year in a star. Um, but as Rob said, the safety case currently only covers A switches, it only covers depots, um, and we're limited to 24, 24, yeah, 24 kilometers an hour. So realistically, again, the, the requirement for the deep tube has gone away. We've gone away from doing deep tube uh, PNC renewals in recent years. Um, we thought there was going to be a lot more coming, but that's that dried up a bit. So again, if we want to start looking to install them on the deep tube, um, in those situations, or if we want to start sort of expanding into B switches, then we're going to need to update the safety case. So, and I think, I guess, anywhere where it would just be those sites where they want to do that, um, just building that time frame in, in terms of the additional testing, which we've had lots of experience of now in terms of uh, how long that takes and making sure <coughs> that's appreciated within the programs for these jobs. And finally, so yeah, so obviously as a department, this has been going on a very, very long time. And so uh, we didn't we didn't feel that we could sort of you know, stand up here <laughs> and uh, talk about this uh, as, as something that was ours. Um, but there's been an awful lot of people, as I say, as Rob said, this there was no funding particularly for this as a job, um, as a standalone development. It's happened as a result of of jobs that we've had coming along and so each job that's come along um, each project that it's been used on has sort of developed it bit by bit and so a lot of these people um, are also to be thanked so uh yeah thank you very much let's do it uh, yeah have you got any questions <laughs> i'm not quite clear what the longer term future holds in terms of the scope um, in terms of the number of types of turnout you want. I mean, you talk about F, and you mentioned three is the next stage. Presumably, as the turnouts get longer uh, into the season D, disappears, yeah. Yeah, the, the case is presumably much weaker. Exactly, was, and, hmm. to, and why we've not bothered with the B, I think, realistically. Um, again, it's sort of, yeah, the, the need was for the A. Yeah. And, and that's what we developed. So as you say, having it much longer than that, at that point, if it was a B already, then maybe we can we can fit in an A, B. So, yeah, so as the turnout got longer, you got you should more space to play with that. Yes. And the and the REPW designs would probably more fit for them as far as it. I would agree. Yeah. It'll be a it would be an odd case, but yeah. <coughs> One of the uh Later slides are you mentioned uh, you had a bullet point on there about neck planing. Yes. Um, is that is that something that the French used in the revolution or, or have we got to... So it just wide it just in terms of running it, we just widened it to I think it was fifty-one millimeters or around there. Um, so yeah, it's something that we use in the crossing. Oh right, okay. So we actually yeah. And what, and what was that? What was that helping? What was that improving? Well, I think it was part of the sort of linked in with the gauge widening, the general gauge widening right. that we put in, in terms of, yeah, this type, type okay. stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> I'd be interested to see a drawing of that. Indeed, <laughs> well, we, yes, it exists. <laughs> but yeah, it was a one off on those really tight switchings in terms really? of but, but on the west end we've oh, not done it anywhere anywhere else so oh, generally right, they're right. all 1435s it was just because we we'd introduced the, the additional gauge widening was 1438 on those because of the uh, were, they, were they fabricated crossings or, or cast generally well so generally we didn't say that did we so so yeah so we have put some as fabricated right but ultimately i think on the west end we had more fabricated than semi welded on the east end i think they were virtually all semi welded in the end so um yeah okay <coughs> thank you
Yes, yeah, sir, thanks. Um, yeah, in terms of, you talk about the school now almost 40, and, and they were all pretty quite new, I suppose. Um, yeah. In terms of reliability, have you got any idea, obviously, and you've changed the POE as well, haven't you? So there's lots of variables in. Yeah. But in terms of reliability, have you any idea of, of whether it's as you expected or, or anything like that? <laughs> I wish we could have more detail, but yeah, we. It's one of those things, isn't it? We've not heard anything, but that does it. They're in depots. Is the problem? I mean, I think in terms of yeah, you know, they are big. I mean, again, it was the sites as Rob said. You know, there's a lot of hand indication that's going on in terms of that. There are sort of people going out, but in terms of the the level of sort of. I guess feedback that we get from them, it's it's not significant, which is why we need to be going out and, and doing that review no, ourselves. No remote conditioning monitoring, for example, showing how much it's strained compared to with no. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> no. My I've got a question from John Dolan on why. Oh, okay. <laughs> which is what sort of speeds are being permitted in the relay depots? So we're at sort of 10, I think we're 10, mile, 10 miles, miles an hour, I think, at Ealing. Yeah, okay. so 16 kilometres an hour. So yeah, we're well below the 24. And one from Darren Sharp. <laughs> Have you taken any switch profile readings to determine the wear rate? We haven't yet, Darren, no. I'm afraid. Yeah, that does, do it does need to happen and we're aware it needs to happen. But yeah, we haven't got there yet. And have you found tradable this? Yeah, so uh, to now, Howard has done all the fabrication for us. So, uh, yeah. Did progress have any involved with the work? Not yet. Yeah. But it's probably coming. Yeah. Right. And when are you going to design us one for the DLR? Go on. Um, with the general drive for all the devils to be on the um, composite seals, is this uh, has been taken into consideration in the shrinkage for them for the age? Well, that's something. <laughs> that's another. <laughs> something else. <laughs> but yeah, we've not seen in terms of. Ealing and uh, we've not seen anything specifically so in terms of the depots it's yeah not something on these that we've seen so that's something that we're aware of but we've got no one for Ealing Common you're having the engine to for the body for the park for the age so obviously if it's shrinkage so it's going to the sleeper would expand potentially causing you know uh, uh, increase in the gauge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think here we, as I say, generally we're on fourteen thirty-five most places, so it's just that very rare. But I don't, as I say, in terms of evidence that there's anything that significant happening. But you've also got to think about in terms of the locations. I mean, the the condition of Ealing before. <laughs> Before we did this work was 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 truly awful. I mean, it wasn't necessarily surprising the developments that we were getting. And in terms of the move towards composite, you know, one of the key factors is the issues of rot and the, the degradation of the timbers that were in the site. So, so yeah, you know, that's a big factor for us in terms of depots being sort of not is significantly maintained to the same way potentially as, as the main line and so going forward composite sleepers for us within the depot are, are a big factor and that's a, a big draw for us so probably is there, but are there still a lot of i switches in the tube loads yeah an awful lot yeah any ideas where you first one might be thick <laughs> yeah, it could end up being big. Yeah. Again, that's the thing. Cause even if we use them as <coughs> switches, say it's we've, with the safety case, we've only got them for the depot, and they're only 
and only the 24. So you know, we, we'd need to have a look at that again. It was one of the restrictions because we'd looked at Edgware Road. I mean, we've done a number of I mean, the all gates, Edgware Road, some of those key pinch points across the system. We, we've ended up looking at layouts which include them, but it was always part of an understanding that we would need to be looking at additional safety case changes and approvals for, for the use of them. If you've got questions, then pass Mike to the other banks. All right, good evening. So you heard it here first, folks. If you want to increase your popularity, reduce your derailments. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to Rob and Zoe for uh, this excellent presentation. Um, even though uh, I stopped doing any design work really about 35 years ago, um, I still think of myself as a designer, even though my design skills are corroded to dust. So I found this very, very interesting. Um, there are many constraints in working on London Underground. Um, finance has been one, more recent years, but um, there's, there's many physical constraints, and as Zoe and Robert so ably demonstrated in their presentation, space is a major one. Um, there's basically never enough space on the underground. And uh, some of you will know Stephen Barber, who, who joined us from, uh, from what I call the big railway, Network Rail. And I think it's fair to say that Stephen was rather horrified when he saw the spaces that London Underground puts trains through compared to uh, practice on Network Rail. Um, it's been an issue for a long, long time, space, because it's a very, very, the majority of it is a very old railway, as most people will know. and. Things were different back in those days. Zoe, you mentioned about the crossover cabins in the tube, which are sized, the length of them is, is sized to accommodate full head geometry. So again, as, as Zoe said in, in one part of her demonstration, uh, presentation, um, if you want to put longer flat bottom geometry in there, you have to do all sorts of things. Um, pushing the toes into the running tunnels, Zoe mentioned that. Playing with the geometry of the of the turnout or the crossovers, I also mentioned that. So it's really, really difficult, not just for junction work, but in other ways as well, to retrofit modern componentry and systems into an old railway. But that's part of what is being is means it, that's part of what working on the underground is why working on the underground is so much fun. Because you've got to squeeze this modern stuff into this old railway. Um, so yeah, so we've always had these, these space constraints. Um, I remember my, my good friend, uh, Mark Driscoll, who did the first CAD design crossover for London Underground. And that was seven crossover at Piccadilly Circus on the Bay Glue Line. And we did all sorts of things back in those days to squeeze flat bottom junction work into a bullet space. Um, we were going to see our good friends at Lily Bridge, uh, John Brown and Phil Galligan and Howard Russell, and they would machine base plates for us and machine rocks to funny shapes for us, and we put non-standard drillings into, into stock and switch rails, and we get something in. Um, I think, working from my highly favourable memory, Mark's design had a 56 metre radius on the turnout on the southbound. Which is normally a, normally a trailing uh, set of points, I hasten to add. Um, I encountered it when I did a design for a uh, Metropolitan Line uh, junction work just north of Baker Street Station. And it was all going very, very well until my design got to Platform 4, which is a terminal platform. <laughs> and uh, there just wasn't quite enough room to squeeze a standard AB7 <laughs> turnout in. So I again went to see the guys at Lily Bridge Workshops and we you know, got something that fitted. Not very nice, not very elegant, but hey, it fitted. The work that you have seen in this presentation tonight, none of that was done at that time, okay? This thorough, thorough testing and assessment of designs and evaluation of all those criteria, that is a really, really good example of how it should be done. And it's worked so far, hasn't it? There we go. You know, you know what they say about no news is good news. So the fact it's all been quiet is probably very good news. 
So um, thank you once again for a great presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Would you please join me in a round of applause to thank Zoe and Rob for their time this evening. March, Lima and Sunday is going to be building information modeling. That'll be here at the same time. Uh, I saw some, I think we're going to adjourn to. Oh, oh, line. Line. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we going to Mike. We're going to the red line. Yeah, yeah, the red line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it is still the red line. Mike's been researching bugs for us. It's also clear. Outdoor, yeah, along to the left. Um, yeah, thank you very much for Thanks. this presentation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.